Good evening and welcome to the reporters. They are young, they are vulnerable, and they are easy prey for the vultures of the streets. They are America's children, runaway kids who are slipping through the cracks in our cities from coast to coast. On any given day, there are 10,000 children who should be finding warmth and protection at home, who should be going to school, who are instead scavenging for food, sleeping in doorways, and sinking into the abyss of loneliness, fear, and desperation in a seemingly uncaring and violent world. This next story is about one of those runaway kids. She's from Oregon, and she calls herself Tina. The Strip. You can find one in just about every major city in America. Two-bit motels, fast food restaurants, X-rated movie joints, all casting an eerie neon light on the darkness of night. Yo, baby. Yo, come on over here. You're looking good. And on almost every street corner, young women waiting to sell quick sex or quick cash. What do you want to do? How much you want to spend? I don't know, maybe like 50 bucks. Let's see. Let's see the, the money. money. Yeah, money. Make sure you got it. This strip in Orange County, California, is right down the street from Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. But happiness ends where the strip begins. Red light districts like this one attract not only hookers who choose to sell their bodies for money, but runaway kids as well. Kids as young as 12 or 13. Now, I heard that there was a couple of young white but I haven't seen him lately. She was what, about 13? 14, something like that, yeah. I haven't seen her, though. Some are forced to sell themselves to survive, to get money for food or a place to sleep. You could hardly call them hookers. They are victims in every sense of the word. And once they're into the life, it's hard to get out alive. Ready to see what happens? What has she been taking? She's, I don't know. Open your Something's eyes. sticking out. Come on, now. Call you We're here to help you. Yeah. I, want to look I thought I was going to die here. I probably will. Most, most kids do. You hear about kids dying all the time. I thought, well, I'll come out here, stay here for a while, and then probably just die. When we first met Tina, she was living in this shelter for runaways near Hollywood Boulevard. She'd been here only a few weeks after six months on the streets. What happened to Tina is a horror story that no 13-year-old child should ever have to endure. I don't trust anybody. No one? No one on the face of this earth? I don't know if I, so far I haven't. With everybody I have trusted, I always get screwed over. When did you make the decision to run away? I, I've been wanting to leave since I was nine or 10. But I thought, where could I go? I'm too young, I don't, there's no way I can get money to get on a bus and go someplace. You wanted to leave when you were nine years old? Nine or 10. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to leave so bad. Why? Because I hated it. How come you never talked to your mom or dad about how you felt? My mom's not there. She's, She's never there. there. She's at work. And then she comes home from work? About 6. And she talks on the phone for hours, then she goes to sleep. And your dad, he didn't take much of an interest in you either? Mm -mm. I never, I never knew my dad. I mean, yeah, sure, he was my dad, but I mean, he came home, did nothing. That's it. Tina began to withdraw into her own world plotting how she would go to Hollywood and become a star. Her grades went from A's to F's. She got into fights at school. She argued with her parents at home. Tina's mother, Christine, not her real name, says her daughter's emotional problems began about the time she and Tina's father divorced. And I knew things were not as they should be, but I wasn't sure, you know, exactly what to do. And it was really hard for me to convince her that I really cared and that I loved her. And that, you know, she could feel free to open up, you know, and talk things out. She just shut herself off. At the age of 12, Tina ran. She made her escape from her family. She started her long journey to a new life in California, hitchhiking down the interstate. She hooked up with another hitcher, a man in his 20s. She said that on their first night together, he raped her on the side of the freeway. And he forces you to have sex with him? Mm hmm You're 12 years old? Are you fighting him? I was to begin with, but I said, forget it. 
Let him do whatever as long as I get to California. I hated it, yeah. But I thought that's life. That's how I thought life was going to be from now on. And Tina was right. Life on the streets was a far cry from the Hollywood of her dreams. Her first night in California, she was hungry and homeless. She spent the night huddling in an alley. She couldn't sleep. She was too frightened to close her eyes, too stubborn to cry. You gotta be tough. I mean, that's just, I don't know. I'll probably be this way until I die or something. So, no how old I get, it's just something I learned. Tina found a hideaway under some trees near the Santa Monica Freeway. Her bed was an old piece of cardboard. Tina says she often went hungry, not eating for days. She says she was forced to steal food to survive. I go into a store and just pick it up, get a bag, get a jacket or something, big pockets, take whatever I want and leave. If they catch me, tell me to go to a back room. I just start running. That's your shopping trip? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you call it? A five-finger discount. After just a few short weeks on the street, the police picked Tina up and sent her back home to Oregon. And almost immediately, she began devising a new escape plan. This time, she would get her stepfather to bring her on a vacation to Disneyland. On the very night they arrived in Los Angeles, Tina vanished. I knew where I was going. I was going to go to Teen Canteen on Hollywood Boulevard. Tina was tougher this time. She knew what to expect, or at least she thought she did. She had learned from other street kids how to scavenge for food, how to steal and beg to survive. But the cruelest lesson of all was still to come. A 16-year-old she met at a shelter told her there were still other ways to tough it out on the street. I said, that's cool. I can do it, too. She told me how much money she made. I said, that's cool. I want to make that much money. So, so Tina ended up at Disneyland after all. Only the rides she was taking weren't fantasies for kids. They were rides with strange men. Tina says she felt that was the only way she could survive. Money was everything. <clears throat> yes. When you, do, when you don't have any money out here, money is everything. Right then, you don't care. But beneath Tina's streetwise exterior was a child of 13, a kid who was desperately fighting for her life in this violent underworld of crime. Fear was a luxury she couldn't afford. You can't act scared around a guy. I mean, you got to be in control. But how does a 13-year-old girl be in control of a 30-year-old guy? I don't know. You just do. I mean, act in there all, you know, get in there, act all tough and bad. Act like you're older. That's what I do. I asked Tina if she knew other kids her age who had worked on the street. A lot of them are older. I met one girl. She's 12. So you're really about the youngest one out there on the streets. Mm. Don't you find that a little strange? Yeah. But just like then, they told me they came out here when they were 13 and 12. Ironically, it was Tina's age that brought her sordid life out here to an end. A pimp who found out that she was only a kid of 13 called up the organization Children of the Night and told them to get her off the streets before it was too late. I had gotten a call from a pimp, which is fairly unusual, um, saying that he had a real young girl that was just too young, and he kept telling me he's just, just too young, she's just too young to be out here. So he told us that he would uh, stick her in a cab and bring her to us, basically. Children of the Night referred Tina to the shelter where she was living when we met her. But having a bed and a place to sleep at night couldn't save Tina from another violent and tragic episode on the streets. It happened when she hitched a ride to her shelter. He reaches behind, he pulls out this big old machete or whatever. And, you know, he's telling me he's got a gun in his car, too. And I was like, right. I mean, yeah, I was scared and everything. And he took me to some alley, like across from Hollywood High or something. And, I mean, he raped me. He was saying, you know, I'm going to cut your face into tiny pieces, a thousand pieces and stuff, and they're, you know, I'm going to cut you up and they're never going to find you again and all this, and nobody will hear from you. You're only 13 years old. You've been raped twice, threatened with death. What do you think about it all? It sucks. I, mean, 
Most of the 10-year-olds would be at home watching the Brady Bunch or something. Tina's rape confirmed her family's worst fears. Her mother begged her to come home. It made me sick for a few days. I was physically sick, and I had to take a day off work. And um, I guess, you know, I felt like that was about the worst thing that could have happened to her besides being murdered. Tina's mother could only guess what her child's life on the streets had been like. She didn't know the whole story. But for Tina, that life, no matter how violent or lonely or degrading, was still better than living at home. To understand why, we asked Tina's mother to come see her daughter in Los Angeles. She immediately agreed. She hadn't seen Tina since she'd run away from home. Can I give you a hug? Yes. You mind? Guys, don't. <laughs> I love you. Your hair is so weird. Okay, I can Because I'm getting older. <laughs> The first awkward moments passed, and soon Tina was telling her mother about a place on the beach in Venice where you can pay 10 bucks to record a song. We took them there. For Tina, it was a moment she'd been waiting for all her life, a chance to prove to her mother and to herself that she could be somebody. Gave my love, did me wrong, didn't know what to do. As she sang, the little girl who set off on a dream and found a nightmare the child who never cried or showed she was afraid was shaking, but her voice rang clear. Was true, still you threw it all away. Now other guys will have me, they'll appreciate my love. Tell me, how does it feel? It was as if Tina and her mother had somehow found a link. As the afternoon progressed, they seemed to get closer but the tension was still there. We asked them if they would talk about it. How do you feel about being together right now? I'm very glad to see my daughter. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty excited yesterday when we told you we were thinking about doing this, that your mom was going to come down here and see you and see you sing. But at the same time, you, you feel that you can't be there. I don't understand how the two of them met. It's nice to see her. It's just that I don't want to live at home. What would you like to tell your daughter if you have an opportunity to tell her something right now? I love you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get emotional. I love you, and I care. I may not like what you're doing with your life right now, but I love you. I always will. Do you love your mom? Yes. How can you do that to someone you love? When you want to do something bad enough, you do it no matter what. I have a feeling you miss your mom a lot. <laughs> Don't cry on my shoulder. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't even cry. I'm not as tough as you are tonight. <laughs> despite what Tina learned on the streets, despite the experience she had with her mother, despite the caring they showed for each other, Tina still refuses to move back home. The day after we taped this interview, Tina's mother signed papers for her to live in a foster home. A week later, she moved in with her new foster family. And just a few days ago, she went back to school again. She's now in the eighth grade. And Tina says she is happy with her new life. For the kids that are out there and they're gonna watch this story, what would you tell them about the streets? Sucks, don't go. Nothing there. You can't get anything out of it. It was just bums, trouble. That's about it. It's a strange religious cult based here in New York City, but this, this is a cult with a difference. Do, do you see devils here in this picture? This. Members believe God turns their rosaries from tin to gold, uses blessed rose petals to cure the sick and the lame, and they believe the Virgin Mary speaks directly to the leader of their cult and to the leader of our country. Now, surely the president wouldn't take any of this seriously, would he? Want to bet?